All right. Okay, I have another really important conversation here, and this is specifically with the National Action Network. So Derek Perkinson, crisis director for NAN, yes. and hello, welcome. And welcome, welcome. Thanks for having us, Chris. We really appreciate it. Yes. This is an important discussion. Absolutely. And I really do do appreciate and uh, rely on your honest conversations about these kind of potentially contentious and uncomfortable conversations of race relations between the Black and Chinese community. Um, and so let me introduce my other guests uh, before we kick off the discussion. Chaplain Cole Knapper uh, is part of the National Action Network. And well, actually, I would like you both to kind of tell us what you want to tell us about yourselves, because you're all connected in so many ways. I know, Derek, you you're, you grew up in Harlem, but um, you know you're very involved as a crisis director and and chaplain you you were you're a veteran and you're from Athens Georgia which speaks directly to the kind of community that we're talking about in the film and um yeah so Derek please tell us what you want us to know about you first no sure, no definitely um my name is Derek Perkinson I'm with the National Action Network civil rights organization started 31 years ago uh, this year by Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton, attorney Michael Hardy, and also one of the original incorporation signers was our current mayor, Eric Adams, which is just a fun fact to put out there. Um, I'm the uh, crisis director currently. I'm also the New York State field director here, four years now at the National Action Network. And this is where I met Cole Knapper. Um, Cole Knapper, the hero of our country, served our country well, and, and she and I became uh, fast friends, actually, doing the work of the people, um, serving the underserved, serving those without a voice, which is very important. So as Redmond Sharpton is a national figure, um, he's built that up in his, his more than 60, 67 years in, of, of his life and career. Um, we tried to um, help those, me particularly in New York State, statewide, but also as the national crisis director, nationwide, nationwide. So Cole is a very big partner in that, um, in covering the terrain of the nation. Um, so we try to help people where we see fit. And this is a, a project of mine that I've been working with, uh, being that um, good friends with the Asian American uh, community, Asian Island, the Pacific community, and uh, Congresswoman Grace Ming and others. And, and I've always um, wanted to find somewhere to connect with the community, that's not just when something happens in the community. So, um, and this is a good starting point uh, to have these conversations and to bring our communities together um, to see that we're not that different. You know, we're not that different with the discrimination that that we face, the discrimination that uh, your your community face, your culture face. So, it's it's we have to find that commonality to move forward so that we could grow together. So this is really, really uh, something big that came across our screens and our way. So I'm Chris, I'm glad that you made it. And I'm glad that um, Cole brought it to our attention along with uh, Morris um, and, and Porter as well. So uh, salute to the team. So with that further ado, I'll let uh, Cole Knapper, the, 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 my hero, introduce herself. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm just gonna be super brief. Um, I'm Chaplain Cole Knapper and I am from Athens, Georgia. And so uh, I am a nationally action, National Action Network ordained chaplain. And so um, I am just incredibly thankful uh, to Reverend Al Sharpton for his leadership and bringing, uh, doing so much work and having it reverberate in this way. Um, so I am from Athens, Georgia. And so Crystal, your film really uh, resonated with me on so many different levels. Um, and as a Southerner, uh, as a black Southerner, I am uh, incredibly excited about the conversation that your documentary opens up and I'm excited to be here today. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you to both of you. So let's kick off. Um, you know, our discussion around the issues addressed in the film, which is really kind of the, the race relations, the untold stories of this really unique um, community of Chinese immigrants who plotted themselves and developed their livelihood uh, in the Black neighborhood of Augusta, Georgia during Jim Crow. Um, just that alone already kind of opens up a lot of questions, I think. It's like, first of all, what? There are Chinese in the South, people don't know that, and why? You know, the historical, the, the way history is produced and recorded always is, you know, 
under the power of people who are in control. And these mostly minority groups and marginal communities often get left out. And so I also wanted to bring attention to the fact that, you know, we are raising voices, as you said, one of the um, big missions of the National Action Network is to kind of serve those without a voice. And I think this is a space where we do that. And who doesn't have a voice? For me, um, marginalized communities include the Black community, includes the Chinese community. And within the Chinese community, I focus on women's stories, actually I'm in both communities, because I feel like there's an extra layer of that lack of recognition of their perspective. So um, before I share a link, did any of you want to kind of share anything that specifically struck you uh, from our film? I, yeah, um, it, it was it was really the perseverance, um, you know, that your family went through, um, you know, establishing the store there in the South. Um, you know, we hear about the things that happen in the black community and and we take it, you know, we take it for what it's worth. But then when we see what happened, um, you know, to your family and to, you know, your community, it's like, wow, we didn't know that. We thought we were the only one, you know. Um, so it was very impactful, very enlightening in that sense. Um, but he had a successful business. The business was doing very well um, as, as, as well. So that was something inspiring as well that, you know, a minority was making it in the South um, through, through all the uh, obstacles that he was facing to really, you know, make a living for his family. Yeah. Thank you. Chaplin, do you have any other comments you want to share? Oh, yeah. Let's so many. <laughs> I mean, so much. I mean, first of all, it's just, it's, it's a, a beautiful film. Um, really extremely well done. And it made me proud, um, you know, of, of that history that's here in Georgia. You know, um, Georgia has always been, uh, has a rich history of, of being a battleground uh, in many ways. And so um, one of the key things that resonated with me about um, your telling your family's story um, was, just how uh, powerful it was because I, as a person who grew up in the South, had only ever, when I grew up uh, in the South, um, we had in school, they just gave us black, white, or other, other. And so the way that you bring this blurred color line in and talk about it in a way, I, I just, just I think it was really poetic and beautiful. And um, yes, I, I think that it's gonna open up a lot more conversations um, that we we haven't had before. Yeah. And so I'm incredibly yeah. thankful for it. Yeah. And I, and you know, sometimes people ask me what's the significance behind the title. And I don't think a lot of people are necessarily aware of the famous line by W.E.B. Du Bois, right? Of how the kind of the problem with our country is the problem with the color line. And I'm playing off of that because um, you know, I think historically we always tend to reduce things to a black and white narrative as much as we need to recognize this color line that exists that that kind of is the foundation of all these tensions that are, you know playing out today, but the Chinese position complicates the narrative. It's like, oh, so well, all this in between space. So which fountain did they drink from if we are in such a black and white space? Which which part of the bus did they sit on? Which where did the which theater did they go to? And you know, it's it was fascinating for me to learn about the the specific um, spaces that they occupied or navigated between uh, in this time and how that really kind of revealed and reinforced this white supremacist structure that we need to address, right? Um, you know, on the surface, we see all oh, these Chinese speaking with Southern accents. Oh, that's cool and fun and interesting. But what is it really revealing underneath it? What is, what is, what shaped the identities of the position of the Chinese that speak to perhaps why they uh, feel like they're more white adjacent? And what does that mean? You know, there's so, so many questions in my head and I would love, love, love to hear how you feel about this. So um, why don't we kick it off with one of the um, lighter clips that I wanted to share. And I don't know if you remember, because I think food brings people together. Food is a way Always. to bring connections, right? Um, so let me food just- Food and yeah. music. Food and music. <laughs> music, yes. But you know what? Food I'm going to say the Chinese don't have as great music. <laughs> I just, <laughs> I wish. And that's where James Brown comes in for this story yes. too. Yeah. Let me, um, 
let me just share and let me just play this one clip just to kind of um, give you a little refresher on the film clip. This is uh, my family and uh, they're having a gathering around my aunt's place before I interview them. So. Oh, what is this? Mama bought, uh, it looks like pig's feet. Gee, girl. Yeah. So how would you eat it though? You would just eat it by itself? Yeah. Yeah, it's all... It's all, you know, soft stuff. Yeah. You eat it with sauce? Here, I'll put this in for you. No, only the pig feet in Georgia. Back in Georgia. Yeah, pickled pig feet. Yeah. That's not this. Yeah. No, this is French pig feet. But the pickled pig feet you're talking about, is that a southern thing? Yeah, it comes in jars. Who, who eats pickled pig feet? Everybody. So where does it come from? What? The origins of people eating pig feet. I know. See, yeah, goes back well, to that. Eat, uh, well, I'm just a chicken feet. Yeah, who started eating that first? <laughs> While the Chinese struggling to survive figured out creative ways to eat odd animal parts, enslaved people were tossed scraps of meat parts that white people didn't want, and they found their creative ways to prepare it too. So foods like pig's feet and chicken's feet, they share some deep historical significance on both sides. So and Jenny, when you went there, you never grew up with this. So how did the segregation thing affect you? Well, uh, I thought it was kind of strange. And then not there was not that many Chinese and I felt people were just staring at me all the time. Yeah. And then did you just assume you were on the white side or did you question where you were supposed to be? No, I, I, I realized uh, where I should be. Huh. huh. Yeah. So you never made friendships with any of the black customers, none of the regulars who came in? No, no that wasn't allowed. So how do they, how do your parents tell you that? That you just grow up knowing not to? Well, well, that, if you, if oh. you attempt, uh, the, then they get angry. They get angry and threatened. Uh, uh, they explain why? Oh. No, no. So what was your understanding of why? You're not just, you're not, you know, supposed to uh, do exactly what they say, don't question. Okay. So how do you feel your initial thoughts about that? The idea that the Chinese were brought up to basically stay away from the black community and also the connectivity through foods and the histories. It was like what you touched upon with the uh, white supremacist system. They used that to, you know, make the blacks seem the worst they can be um, to divide us. You know, um, they do do that to the to the white people. You know that they didn't have a lot of money to the poor white people at the time to, you know, make them think they're superior. So um, it's a superiority. So everyone is superior to than the blacks, right? That's the thinking. That's the that's the system, right? And and everyone see the way blacks are treated and they want to shy. They don't want to be treated that way. So they're going to shy to in another ethnicity group that's not being as, as terrorized as the black community, um, as I saw it. So I thought it was fitting. That's why I said it was it was fascinating to see that, um, you know, the, the pig feet, you know, um, they, they were eating pig feet. You know, we didn't think, you know, um, you, you know, the, that community eats pig feet like that as well. Um, so yeah, it's, it's the white supremacist system, um, you know, demonizing the you know people for their this color of their skin, um, in, in the years of shadow slavery, you know, it was it was it was hundreds of years of that. So generations, you know, went through that. Um, so that's a trauma mentally that's that's still with us, you know. So if we look at the history of this country, you know, we've been in slavery longer. We've been out of slavery, and we're, so we're still fighting for a lot of things here. Um, but again. Being that with a demonized set, uh, you know, on the on the planet, uh, you know, everyone shies away. You know, you know, you even have this, some Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, they they you know shy away. Some of them they say think they're white, uh, you know, sort of thing. But it, it's the white supremacist system. They got to have, you know, a bad guy, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Chaplain Cole. Yeah, so I would say um, I agree with what Derek was talking about, this, this idea of light skin privilege. Um, and I think that your aunt, that, that exchange that you had with your, your aunts there was so rich because you, you asked like, you know, did you ever have any idea of where you belong? And she's, she just sat back and she's like, 
No, I always knew where I belonged. <laughs> I always knew I belonged with the white folks, right? Like I knew that I, I could pass. I knew that I could be in that space. And I knew that the other was something that I absolutely did not want to have anything to do with. And so um, one other quick thing that you, that you really hit on well in, in this film is just this idea uh, that uh, people who, uh, immig uh, who are immigrants to this country um, get here and they learn very quickly that black people are on the bottom. And so they need to be one step above. And so, yeah, you and Isabel Wilkerson and cast. Um, <laughs> oh man, that's an amazing, that powerful book, right? Fabulous. Yeah, so the whole idea of, of caste, class, hierarchies, color line, it's all really the same problem we have. Um, so on one hand, you're saying, you know, um, yes, they kind of needed their ways to survive. And in order to survive, they needed to step on someone else to get above. Um, but they themselves are others as well. You know, even though they think of themselves as fitting in with the whites, they are still othered. So it gets really kind of complicated. But how does this address and speak to today's anti-Black racism? Because that's an ongoing thing that I always um, find hard for the Asian community to community to address. And, and I think it stems back to historically, like how you're brought up and, and the things that formed it going back to the system, right? So what are some thoughts on that? Oh, you're muted, I think, Derek. I'm sorry, you want That's me? Okay, okay sure. There, what, yeah. What, what was your question on exactly on what? How does this address anti-Black racism today? Because we see these kind of um, attitudes that formed back then when the Chinese community were trying to protect their children and family members and trying to stay ahead, so to speak, you know, to climb up the social ladder, survive, assimilate, whatever it is. But at the same time, by doing that, you're oppressing, you're continuing to reinforce that otherness of the Black community and, 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 and exacerbating that type of disenfranchisement. And so that all plays into this idea of our anti-Black um, perspective that's still played out today. Just wanted to know how you felt about that. I mean, it's tough because that's what we're here now, right? We're trying yeah. to find a common ground for the community. Again, we just identified um, we have to have a villain, a bad guy in our yeah. society. Um, unfortunately, you know, most people, you know, good, black, white, good, bad, more or less. Um, so, again, um, what, what, you know, what can we do to, to you know, because our community know the horrors of, of what happens to us, right? Um, we're seeing the horrors that happen in your community as well. And it's, you know, especially in now time with, with, with individuals here on uh, New York, particularly, we've seen some. Um, hate crimes um, towards the Asian community that's horrific, you know, getting pushed in front of trains and getting followed home um, to their homes. Um, it's, it's just really horrific what's happening. Um, and again, being picked on um, because, you know, you, you know, the Asian community basically tries to stay out the way. You know, they, you know, they, they, they ease, you know, through the cracks. They, they don't want to be and you know we don't we don't get a lot of um, Asians out of our, our marches, our protests, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, but we do see them when when something really bad happens in the community, they come out and they they can stand with us. And they and you know speaking to a few in the community, they want to um, help more, but from behind the scenes because it's not a, like a, a culture that's on the front line and want to be you know um, all the shine and spotlight. So um, we have to identify the pain. The pain is our commonality. Um, and, you know, that's the pain that we both can uh, come out of the pain in, in the healing fashion, right? Um, because mm -hmm. the pain is, is, is unique to both of us, to both yeah. our cultures. You know, uh, we get hated on uh, at a, a more astronomical rate. If we can stop by a police officer, we don't know if it's going to be our last time or not. You know, things can happen off of a police stop, child, you know, for you didn't turn, use your signal, you know, your broken taillight or you were speeding. And this could be the last time uh, you deal with someone in your life. So that's um, a crazy we, we thought, have, though, Derek. That's, that's a crazy, crazy thought. thought. And I touch on that briefly in my film. You know, a scenario of that, the assumption that you know that uh, that somebody because of the color of their skin is assumed to be somebody of a violent you know threat. Whereas in the Asian community, we grow up 
never thinking that, you know, gosh, you know, if we get stopped by the police, is it because I spoke on the phone? It's not because of anything right. with a threat of your life, you know? So it, it's just really crazy that, that you mentioned that. And it brings perspective to how different communities feel about that based on race. Yeah. Now, race is, is definitely important uh, factor in it, um, you know, and, but again, we, we have to find the, the commonality, right? The common, what's common? Um, and, and hurting people sh shouldn't be accepted by anyone. Violence shouldn't be accepted by anyone. Um, you know, we need to get it out of our cartoons. You know, we got Tom and Jerry. Mm. I grew up on Tom and Jerry. Yeah. The cat and the mouse hitting each other and we laugh, you know, yeah. and we, yeah. we desensitize to these things. Um, we had a situation where, um, right. we had a situation where um, Will Smith committed a, a violent yeah. act mm. on television in front of millions of people. Um, and it was really bad. And, and in our community, hitting someone is not looked at as a crime. It's just, oh, we had a fight, this guy, but it's an assault. And, and we look at it, we're desensitized to the, to the violence, to the pain. So, um, you know, we, we have to, you know, desensitize violence, you mm. know, make people really feel, yeah. know what's wrong. And, and for me and for my, you know, I guess role, or uh, I feel like it's my, responsibility as a filmmaker is to bring light to the connectivities as you spoke of instead of focusing on the negative things is to bring to light some the connections between two communities and histories that we don't see and maybe by understanding each other's communities and past and you know the interactions and involvements that we might deepen our perspective to open up a, a, a richer sense of understanding i think you're muted again derek <laughs> but were you trying to say something? No, no. Go okay. Ahead. Okay. Um, Chaplain Cole, did you have something to add to that? Um, I, I just a little bit to the to the uh, previous part. Yeah. Just about anti-black, um, you know, this anti-black sentiment. One of the most powerful aspects of the movie of your documentary for me was came at the near the beginning where you're on the bus and you're interviewing the um, older gentleman. And he says something that's so racist that you can't even <laughs> like, there's no way you could film that. And then, you know, you'd have to have a whole arc about what he said. Um, that to me uh, was really powerful. Like this idea that there are conversations that are had in every household um, uh, where people, you know, your family was taught that they couldn't be friends with black people. They couldn't be friends with people that looked like me. And I never, since I didn't grow up, you know, in, I was born after 1970. So uh, I never grew up in a segregated society. So for me, it was shocking to hear that your family was told that they couldn't even be friends with black people, that there was such a hard color line there. And so um, thank you for, for that. Yeah, yeah. It complicates things, doesn't it? To and, and and I just don't. That's why I want to hear how you feel about that because I've never been not been able to friend someone because of the color of my skin. And, and to me, that sounds just so crazy. You know, it's like maybe okay, you don't like me because of my personality. Sure, fine. Or because I'm not like rich, like in your class, or you know, yeah, okay, fine. But when it comes down to this and how deeply racialized our country is in judging people by that, still, it's just. It's very troubling to me. And, and, and there's layers to no it. It's not only, yeah, yeah, and there's layers to it. It's not only race with color, it's also economics. Yes. And, and what you have, and then there's education. Yes. Um, you know, lack of education um in the communities and how is it's it's enforced in different communities and how it's encouraged in all com other communities. Um, the quality that's that's given, you know, to different communities versus others. Um, healthcare, of course. So it's, it's different layers to it as well. Yeah. Um, and again, nobody wants to be on this side, you know, so, I, you know, I'm not upset with anyone who's, who doesn't want to be on this side, you know, no one wants to be, and that's what we're fighting for here at the National Action Network to, you know, Reverend Sharpton always talks about equality. He wants, if, if, if a police officer pull over a white guy and it goes like this, ABC, if he pulls over a black person or a person of color, it should go like this, ABC. He doesn't think it should be different for, for two different just because of the color. So, and that's what we fight for every day. And that's why we're here. Yeah. And, and that's why we need to have context to how we 
who tells the stories and how they tell the stories. You know, I think there's a lot there, you know, how things are framed. Um, and I, that's a big part of my kind of process is trying to figure out what is said and what's not being said and what's being said, if that makes sense. So I wanna share this one clip that um, part of it is in the film, but a st extended part of it is not. And I wanted to maybe um, run this through you both and, and see how you feel about it. It's just a little, it was in my process of putting it together and I wove together some um, specific um, issues that I wanted to address. So let me share that again. Sounds good. Okay. Can you can you see this? Okay. All right, let's watch this. <laughs> no? No. So you had white people and black people in your school? And only white people, there were no blacks. Yeah. No blacks. It was no blacks. They could have stuck us a black school don't that never did come up. Yeah. Did you think that, the, how did you feel how they treated the black people then? I don't care about that. I never thought about it because that's where we live. We live among the black people. We didn't have any trouble. But where Harry and his family lived, they were cutthroat. Yeah, Mr. Warren, he's a credit my mother, you know, when we were growing up. I stayed right down the street down in West Avenue. Yeah. He's a credit, you know, let you know, yeah, tell my right. daddy. Yeah. So it was part of your life here though because you yes, came to the store all the time i'm still here i know still, I'm... that's incredible <laughs> so you don't have any comments on the chinese when they're living here yes ma'am they're good people yeah. very good people mm -hmm. yeah but at that time is when they were talking you about segregation we were yeah. here and, and if they said okay they're colored yeah, yeah. so they got to be over here on the black side yeah i mean so how do you think of this whole color line thing yeah well, there's some smart people at that time frame that made the decisions that uh, they kind of saw there was problems, but they wouldn't have it. Do you know whenever my son was born, he was born in a civilian hospital, and the doctor I went to when we went to the when I went to the doctor it was a black entrance and a white entrance. No. And the first time I went, I went. Why? Well, not white either. <laughs> Which way do I go? Okay, so uh, so I said, okay, I'm more white than I am black. I'll go in the white. <laughs> See, but that's it. It you was confused. To, yeah, had to decide. Okay, so that was just a little uh, kind of compilation of some issues I wanted to address. And I, the part with um, Aunt Lorraine talking about not going to a school with black people um, is in the film. And I chose that because it's interesting how she was convinced she didn't see it as segregation. It was just that, oh, there are no black people in her school. <laughs> What's the big deal, right? In her world, that's all it was. It wasn't, a, she didn't even probably understand that idea or maybe she did and she didn't want to talk about it. I'm not sure. She she made a point exactly what I said. It's the black bathroom or the or the white one. Well, I'm not black. I'm not white. But you know what? I know I don't want to go in the black one. You know, I'm gonna go to the white one because you'll be treated different. Um, you know, and you know, it's tough. It's tough. Yeah, that that's Aunt Lorraine's daughter. Um, and okay, so let's talk about her husband's comments. It. Every time I watch that, I, I just, I don't know. It just, it's, there's so much loaded in there because he's saying there wasn't really a problem that some smart people did something. And I'm totally don't want to disrespect him, but I have to bring it out that what I see is his context as a white person looking at it from his side of the history that it wasn't a big problem because they didn't see it because they didn't have to be on that side of that, <laughs> what was happening. Cause they can move about un un yeah. unabated, you know, they can go to any bathroom they wanted to go to, they could do what they wanted to do. So they were un uninhibited. Whereas, you know, other, other demographics have we were inhibited. So, yeah, I mean, again, I don't, I'm not mad at him even for being honest, you know, that's the way he was. A lot of people thought like him back then, you know, so, um, but things change as we see, 
as as we move forward and we be stronger on on the things we stand upon. Um, so, um, yeah, it was it was pretty tough to him say that because um, you you get the vision on how things were and and why they were like that because if he felt that way, he had a hundred or more people that felt the same way he did, and you know, and that's just how it was back then. Okay, but we say keep saying back then. So does it make it okay for people to have these views back then? Or how are we supposed to change up the narrative today, even if we lived through that and that shapes the way we saw things? Well, again, you know, you know, 240 some years of slavery. Um, we only out 155, if that 53, 54 years out of slavery is it's, it's trauma. So it's, it's a whole, we know it's, it's synthetic, it's, it's system, synthetic, systematic. Um, systemic racism. We know it's systemic, um, and we have to, you know, get through the trauma. You know, um, we have a lot of self hate. We have a lot of, you know, they call it black on black crime, which I don't like to use that term. But we have a lot of crime in in, in different impoverished communities. Um, you know, uh, because of of road rage, you see people the same color, so it's just different energy we give to each other versus other demographics. Um, and you know, and and I, you know, I like to share a lot of people in the, in the, our community. We we look to bully the people in the Asian community, so to speak. Um, out of I don't know why. You know, um, it was when I was growing up. We um, a lot of others in our community. We would bully um, um, those in the LGBT community. But back then we were gay, um, you know, term. But now LGBTQ, um, you know, they. I'm 14, 15, and guys I'm going to school with is, you know, they see a guy walking down the street or a girl, you know, that's gay and they attacking them and, and doing stuff like that. So, you know, you have these things, these moments, you know, that's not right. Yeah. Um, and again, we look in hindsight, it wasn't right then, but we look in hindsight, like that's won't be acceptable now, even though right. a lot of hate is, is going on in our LGBT community, our trans community, especially. Oh, um, violence, a yeah. Of, a lot of things are going yes. on in that community that we have to stand up for because again, all violence is bad, is no yeah. good. And we have to come from a particular um, of, of information. And this is all related, Derek. I'm glad you brought that up and not that we're gonna detour because we have to wrap up. But my, that's my point is using blurring as a concept because by blurring and seeing in between spaces and the connectivity of things that seemingly are very different, that's how we become more empathetic and how we understand each other better so that we don't have these discriminating views against people that we don't understand enough of. And this is, it applies to racism, gender, class, so many, so many things, right? So yes, all Absolutely, and, and this is the images we see when you see um, the news, you know, news is on now. Um, when, when certain individuals on a mass shooting, they don't want to show if he's a white guy, but if it's a black guy, they show his picture. They show this. I mean, it's, it's the media is a part of that too. The yes. narrative um, that controlled the newspapers and the images that's shown um, on these news and making it seem like, you know, this is a common thing in this community for these people. You know, this is the message. Yes. You know, and, it's, and again, it's, it's subliminal. It's, it's years of this trauma that is being pushed upon us programming. Yes. So um, and again, that's what they call it. TV, they call it programming. So they're programming. Yeah, what, what they, and we don't think about it because we're vegetables. We just kind of consume, consume, consume. We just consume. We're walking around with our, our face and our screens and, and uh, yeah. a flashlight. I like to say a flashlight in our face um, all day and uh, social media. You know, that's, yeah. you know, I'm glad we didn't grow up in the social media era, yeah. but um, this is destroying our, our people, but it, it could bring us together, you know, yes. because a lot of people likes to watch that TikTok stuff, a lot of the youth and music, like we've talked in food and music, hip hop is bringing a lot of kids, yeah. like I was on a cruise this past week, I saw a lot of Caucasian kids, Asian kids singing the hardest rapper King Vaughn out of Chicago, he died of murder and he got killed and stuff, but they running around the ship singing his hard song, it's a hard song, and I'm like, you know, hip hop is just touching crevices of the society, um, you know, where, yeah. you know, if you, you like a, a LeBron James, you like these people of color, um, you know, we can't be racist, you know, and they, you know, people in the positions need to speak up more yeah. too, just to denounce hate, yeah. denounce racism. We need know, to be and, critical. And we need to be from. more critical viewers and to question things we see in order to be able to denounce hate and violence. Um, Chaplain Cole, do you have some um, extra final thoughts that to wrap up? Um, I know we have, we could talk for hours about this hard issue. Well, I, so first of all, just thank you for having, thank you for making the film, but thank you for opening up the conversations that we are having. I've never had conversations 
um, like I've had since I've seen your film, never in my life. And they're so necessary right now. And so I just want to thank you for the time and energy that you put into this. And I hope that you will um, continue these conversations um, beyond, beyond uh, what's happening uh, in our immediate future, because I am so here for that conversation, particularly here in the state of Georgia. So thank you. No, thank you. Derek, any final words? Crystal, I just want to say thank you. Definitely thank you for this, this awesome documentary. Looking forward to it, premiering, um, launching, or have, you know, being shown at the Harlem International Film yeah. Festival. Man is going to be there as a partner. I'll be there also. Um, That's right. We're going to get the word out. We're going to get as many people as possible to see this film, this important film, and start having conversations. And yeah. we want to have some healthy conversations and bring our communities together, not only when times of tragedy, but during in between we never want to wish something's going to happen god forbid god forbid but you know if that's not the only time we want to get together and, and hold and stand together and hold hands we want to be together um in between time in the meantime so thank yeah. you for this opportunity no. uh to, you know be a part of this great project well, I look forward to um, this, a deeper discussion with you, Derek, at the live in-person event at the Harlem Film Festival. Again, if those those of you who are listening, um, it is May 7th, it's Saturday coming up, and it's at two o'clock at the AMC in Harlem. I'm not sure exactly what address it is, but you guys can look it up. Right and there by the well, Apollo, is one, one block away from Apollo, not even. There you go. And we have a lot of work to do because this is not the end of the conversation. After this festival, we're going to reach, I want to go all over the country. And, you know, I'm already accepted to the Charlotte Black Film Festival, which is in June. Um, and there are lots of Asian American festivals, but I don't want to compartmentalize. I think the point is we are disrupting racial narratives and having spaces where we can bring different communities together to talk about these uncomfortable pasts while recognizing and celebrating the commonalities. I think that's where we go forward. This is how we go away from violence and talking about negative things is we celebrate our space together that we can come together and talk about these important issues of race relations. So really appreciate both of you. I look forward to seeing you all in person and thank you again, National Action Network. Thank you, Crystal.